All right, hello and welcome. This video is a full breakdown, intro level, but with detail on my coaching philosophy and how we get better as endurance athletes inside of tribal training. This video is 100% inspired by the athlete feedback survey that I sent out this past week. I saw a really common theme amongst the team that we understand generally how to execute sessions. We understand how to improve at fueling. We understand that we got to be doing more as we're building towards a big race distance. But a lot of you would benefit from learning on a little bit of a deeper level. How am I actually getting more fit? How am I getting faster? What can I be focusing on to speed that process up? And generally what is going on as I look to develop as an endurance athlete. And so I've got full breakdown written out here for you. And I am just going to talk over this notion page that I've built out. I'm also going to add this into athlete onboarding. So everyone inside a tribal is going to get access to this and any new athletes that come in, you are going to get this as well. I'm going to give you a quick rundown on what I will cover. So you know that where we're headed together. Number one, endurance development in one sentence. If you can't summarize it in one sentence, you don't know what you're talking about. So we're going to start there. Very, very simple. <laughs> and some of you might only care about that. So uh, if that's you, cool. If you want the details, stick around. Second thing we've got in here is why we get into endurance and then why we stay in endurance. And this is specific to tribal athletes. This is what I have seen amongst the athletes that have been inside the team and then stayed inside the team. Because this is really the foundation of everything. And if you don't have a firm grasp on why you're doing this, or if you don't understand what are the long-term benefits of staying in this, I highly doubt you're really going to give a shit on zone two versus zone four and all that other stuff. <laughs> so we'll lay that foundation first, and then we are going to get into some training specifics. So I'm going to start with how we train, talk about zone development, talk about how we execute on this training day to day, the benefits of different zones. Keep it kind of high level, but kind of get into some detail. I'll share the number one mindset shift for beginner athletes. I'll share what early progress looks like. So these are the first things that if you're somebody who's in here now, you're training for your first 70.3, your first Ironman, like this is what you can focus on. And this is how you can expect to accelerate your development. We will then shine the light up ahead on the path on what does the next level of progress look like? And then we will talk about racing a little bit. So how to execute a race. That's going to be like some larger themed endurance philosophy. And then how to build towards a race. So this is really directed towards somebody who's doing their first 70.3 or their first Ironman. But all of these themes are true across all of endurance, no matter what race you are building towards. Okay. Let's go. Thanks for being here. All right. First thing, endurance development in one sentence. Train the body to put out a steady level of effort for a long time and fuel it to keep going. Technically, two sentences there because I like the period followed by the and, but that's what we're working on. We want to train the body to put out a steady level of effort for an increasingly longer amount of time, and then we want to learn how to give the body the fuel that it needs to keep going. Like that is everything in endurance, whether you're building towards your first 70.3, whether you're doing your first Ironman, whether you're training for a hundred mile ultra, it's all the same, right? Now the specifics of how we get there, of course, that's going to be race dependent, athlete dependent. And that's what we're going to get into a little bit here. All right, next thing, why we get into endurance and then why we stay in endurance. And this is really the foundation. Like I mentioned, if you don't have a grasp on this stuff, I highly doubt you're really going to care about the different interval prescriptions or stuff like that. So I want to lay the groundwork here on why we get in and then why we stay. Because so many guys inside the tribe, myself included, like when I got into this stuff, I didn't really think much beyond my first race. And I didn't think that I would be doing endurance for the rest of my life. But here I am five years later, and I've organized my entire life to prioritize endurance. So let's get into it. Why we get into endurance. So the first three or top three reasons that I see amongst the team, number one is getting back in the arena. Man, we got so many athletes who competed in high school, they competed in college, 
And then endurance or sorry, athletics was completely stripped from their lives. And that athletic identity was limited to just lifting in the gym five days a week. And that sets us up for number two is that we didn't feel challenged enough. So many guys come in, they've been lifting in the gym for a decade, right? They're fit, they're pushing big weight, but they just know, man, I've been in the gym and I'm just not being challenged the way that I want to be challenged. I'm pushing weight, but I'm kind of just going through the motions at this point. I've been doing this for a long time. And that mindset, I see so often in the gym, but then I also see that bleed into work, into hobbies, into lifestyle, into relationships. And so getting into endurance is a way to freaking break frame on all that, man. Throw a new challenge into your life, a physical challenge, a mental challenge, a lifestyle challenge. Like that's what guys are looking for. Number three, family leadership. So we got so many young dads, parents inside the tribe. We got moms and so many of us, like the reason that we're doing this is so that we can be an example for our kids, an example of a healthy lifestyle, an active lifestyle, someone who sets a goal, someone who stays committed to themselves, someone who's convicted in the way they speak about their goals, right? So that's what we're looking for when we start. Now, once we acquire that, here's all the reasons why we stay. Number one, expanded ability. When you're an endurance athlete, you can freaking do more, man. You can experience the world, do cool stuff, explore the world, experience more. Like I got athletes on the team, two hour, three hour trail runs, three, four, five hour rides, like that's no big deal anymore. And that's a pretty freaking cool feeling. Like most people cannot do that. And when you've got more ability, man, why would you want to give that up? Number two is peace of mind. So training, what does this give us? It gives us solitude, time in nature, reflection. It instills patience. It instills discipline. We're not so rattled by like the external world that's always trying to throw crap at us. We're more grounded. We're more stable. And who doesn't need more stability? in 2024, like who doesn't benefit from that? And once you taste that, like, why would you give that up? Number three is enjoying our training. So like, man, when you get fit and you're cruising on the bike at 18, 19, 20, 21 miles an hour, your heart rate's pumping, you're feeling good, you're fueled up, like it feels amazing to exercise. We've broken through that barrier where all those early sessions were a grind. And loving that feeling of training, whether it's swim, bike, or run for you, a mixture of all of them, like, again, why give that up? Number four is enjoying our bodies. So we might be training for like one to two hours a day, maybe more sometimes, but how are we feeling when we are not exercising? When you're a freaking endurance athlete, like you feel good around the clock. You feel really good the other 22, 23 hours of the day. You sleep better. You feel confident in your body, confident in your mind. And we don't want to give that up. Number five is uh, who endurance has helped us become. And the two main themes that I see stick out here are freedom and potential. Man, when you start doing 70.3s and Ironmans, you start taking more freedom in life. You start realizing that you've got a higher potential than you even realized. We got some good examples this past week in the tribe. We had one athlete get a massive raise at work that they'd been building towards for the past year. We had another athlete launch a Substack, start writing online. We had two other athletes run 5Ks with their families for the first time. And so now all of a sudden, like, man, we're calling the shots on our life a little bit more. We're not so limited by our environment. We're not so shackled down by what other people say we are or think we are. We're breaking free. 
And for that reason, we got athletes like Keith Marcus, who spent all of last year building towards an Ironman, not knowing if he could do it, freaking out if he could do it. Ah, I believe I can, but I kind of don't know what the hell's going on. He had never thought beyond that Ironman. He didn't think he was going to be doing endurance forever. Yet when he crossed that finish line and he took inventory of who he became in that process, he said, I'm doing another Ironman. Right. And so I present all this stuff first because this is like the why, right? And we speak on the maze of meaning idea, your individual meaning that can be plugged in here, of course, but these are just the common themes that I see amongst the team. And I want to make sure that we're really grounded in those because that will drive us to actually care about the rest of this stuff. Like if you're just doing a race, cause you're like, oh, I just want to do it. And you're not really taking it seriously. Like you don't, you're not anchored to a strong why your likelihood to really follow the training discipline is probably pretty weak. And so we want to establish that foundation first, but now let's get into it. So how do we acquire all that stuff? Like we just spoke about all this great stuff. Why do we get into endurance? What does it do for us? Why do we stay? Now let's figure out how we get there. First training philosophy that I want to really make sure that you that you see clearly is that easy days stay easy and hard days are hit hard. Easy days. This is your standard endurance effort. Hard days. These are any kind of interval training. I got a quick little grid here, breaking down the five zone system to give you a little bit of clarity on how this should feel, what it looks like, how you're going to see it in training sessions. And this all is built on time in this green zone that you see. So we got zone one that should feel easy. That is warm up intensity, warm up intensity. Most people, when they come into endurance, they've really never done a proper warm up. So really don't discredit this. Like any time in this green zone is building your fitness. And we're going to spend a lot of time. 80% of our time is going to be in this zone one and zone two. So zone one, this feels easy. The intensity is warm up and a sample duration that you'll see in training is 15 to 30 minutes. You're going to see a warm up in the beginning of every single training session, as well as a cool down that gets you back into this same zone. Zone two, this is steady. This is our endurance intensity. And you're going to see this commonly from 45 minutes to three plus hours. And when we think back to that first endurance development in one sentence, we are training the body to put out a steady level of effort for a long time and fuel it to keep going. So when we think about like practically implementing this in training, that is a lot of time in this zone too. Now, of course, we're going to talk about how we actually like improve our ability to hold that work rate, but we'll get to that. Zone three, this is moderately hard. This is your tempo effort, and you will see this generally intervals in workouts from eight to 20 minutes. Now, what I love about zone three is that this really helps athletes understand the concept of gear shifting, which is like my favorite principle for athletes to mentally unlock for themselves right? Like gear shifting. We got the zone two, that's our steady effort. And then we're going to shift up a gear into our tempo effort, which is moderately hard. It feels challenging, but we can hold it 18 to 20 minutes. Then we bounce back down to that zone two, steady intensity. And then we bounce back up, right? So this idea of gear shifting is where we start to unlock, oh, what can I actually hold for a while? Moving up in the zones, we got zone four. This feels hard. This is threshold effort. And you will see this as three to five minute intervals. Zone five, this feels very hard. This is VO2 max training. And you will see this as 20 seconds to two minutes. Now, we got these zones. We got these descriptions. Let's get into like, how are we developing in these different zones? Green zone development, green zone development. This is base building. This is where we are teaching the body to burn fat as fuel. And this is where we're extending our capacity. So if you're a first time 70.3 athlete, like it's going to be new for you to ride for 60 minutes or 90 minutes or two hours or three hours, even just in the zone too. Like we don't need to like work harder for this to still be a new challenge for us. But the benefit of 
working towards going long in your green zone is that any time in your green zone is helping you. And this is like building us up immediately. It strengthens us right away, doesn't really require recovery. And the example that I give here is just that an unfit, unfit person, they only burn hot. And what I mean by that is that somebody who doesn't have endurance fitness, anytime they start running, they're up into zone four or zone five. Their body doesn't know how to work at a low intensity. And so this whole process of endurance is teaching your body how to work at that steady effort, back to the one sentence, and then how to fuel it. And this is where the bike really builds your fitness. So whether you're doing a triathlon, of course, you're going to be riding. But even if you're doing an ultra marathon, or you're focusing on running, you should be biking, because the bike is where we can build fitness so easily. Some quick examples. We got better heart rate control on the bike. I see guys all the time. They come in and they're run. Anytime they're running, their heart rate is 160 beats per minute or above. But they can ride at 130 beats per minute, which means they can go for longer. They are less fatigued. They can recover faster. And they can do more of the overall endurance training. Now, where does the high intensity stuff come in? Because we got to be doing high intensity stuff. And this is where this red zone development, we start to build strength, we build power, stamina, durability, we improve our ability, our body's ability to take in fuel and use it. It's part of the fueling practice that's going on. And then looking ahead to how we're going to develop. So somebody doing their first 70.3, like this is going to be a zone two steady effort all day long. The race is going to take us somewhere from probably five and a half hours to seven hours. And we just want to train the body to be able to put out that level of effort, that steady effort, back to the one sentence, and we want to fuel it well. But as you develop in endurance, you will be able to hold a higher intensity because you've got a stronger base because you've been putting a lot of time in zone two and zone one, and your body is getting more efficient at burning fuel and using fuel that you take in. And a quick example from my own experience is my first 70.3, my first 70.3 run, pure endurance effort, hardest day of my life. I was just holding on and trying to continue going. I had no ability to freaking speed up into my tempo zone. But after doing this for five years, my last 70.3, Oregon 70.3, I held essentially a tempo effort for the entire run. My pace in my first 70.3, the run pace was 843 per mile for the half marathon. And my pace in my last 70.3 was 727. And that came from all these things that you see in this red zone development, more strength, more power, more stamina, more durability, better fueling uptake, but it was all built on green zone development, bigger base, extended capacity, getting stronger right away, not needing a lot of time to recover. So back to the first point in this section, easy days stay easy and hard days are hit hard. As an athlete, I really want to see you taking your foot off the gas a little bit on your endurance sessions, being a little bit more patient with the warm up, And then when these intervals come around, really let it fly and really hammer home. Little pro tip to wrap up this section is that better fueling will burst, boost early progress faster than fitness. I got a story coming up from my own first 50 mile ride where I'll explain that a little bit more. But if you want to make gains early in endurance, you want to be able to go longer. Don't worry so much about like going harder and trying to speed up how you acquire fitness. Instead, think about giving your body more resources to keep going. Back to the first point, steady effort, long time, fuel to keep going. Okay, now let's get into some mindset shifts. So I already mentioned that tons of athletes that come into the tribe, they are coming from some kind of athletic background or they've been hammering strength in the gym. And so many of us, myself included, when I started, we've got this mindset that resistance is met with more force and aggression, right? You're struggling on the bench press, push more, harder. You're playing a sport, maybe you're playing football. You're feeling the opposition and you got to overpower them. You got to overcome them. 
And the endurance mindset is completely different. The endurance mindset is ease off, relax, and keep going. Now, how do we see this play out in daily sessions? What does this mean for you on a freaking Tuesday, right? It means you got to guard yourself against drifting into that moderately hard effort every time. I see this so often. Let's go back to the zones real quick. Guys, don't understand a proper warm up. They think that progress comes from struggling and suffering. So they skip over zone one, they skip over zone two, and they're right into zone three tempo. And they're struggling, so they feel like they're getting better, but they're not actually able to hold it. Right? And so this is back to this concept of easy days stay easy, and then hard days are hit hard. And again, like so many of us, we got this mindset where it's like, in order to get better, we need to struggle and suffer. And what we want to flip around for endurance is that struggling and suffering is actually going to look more like calming the mind. It shouldn't be burning our muscles when we're in our zone one or zone two. It might challenge our mind to ease off, relax and keep going. That's new for us. But that's how we're extending our ability to do this for longer. Now, let's get into early progress. What does early progress look like? Now, this is going to be directed towards somebody training towards their first 70.3, but this is true of anybody in endurance. First Ironman, fifth Ironman, first 100, right? I'm training for my fifth Ironman right now, plus also a 100 miler. (laughs) And these same concepts are true for me as they are for somebody who's training for their first 70.3. Now, progress... It does not look like faster speed. This is specifically true for somebody doing their first 70.3. I'll get onto like my fifth Ironman progress in a second here, but this first phase of progress, it's not going to look like faster speed. So if you are somebody who's so focused on speed, maybe you're seeing your rides at, let's say your last ride was 14.8 miles an hour. You are not making progress by that next ride being 15 miles an hour. Instead, you are making progress by that same 14.8 miles an hour, not taking as much out of you. You are finishing that session with more in the tank. And this again is connecting back to that point above where we don't need to meet resistance with more force. Like it doesn't have to be so hard. We want to ease off, relax, and keep going. Now, While that's true, there's also this layer of truth where it's like, listen, if you're doing big distance and duration for the first time, you can expect to be tired. (laughs) And I got a good example for my first 50 mile ride. So I was living in Philly. It was my third ride ever. I was riding my buddy, Adam. He had just gotten a bike too. We had no idea what we were doing. We're like, let's go ride 50 miles. We're starting in the suburbs in our hometown. We take the Schuylkill River Trail, rail trail, all the way into Philly, into the art museum, all the way back. And that ride absolutely destroyed me. It destroyed me. I remember getting off that bike and just laying on the ground and just being like, how can I ever do anything more than that? That was impossible. Can't believe I even did that. So... There is that level of like, listen, man, if you're doing your first 50 mile ride, your first four hour ride, your first 7,500 mile ride, it's going to take a lot out of you because your body's not used to doing that steady level of effort for a long time and you don't know how to fuel it well. So this is another pro tip. Better fueling will boost early progress faster than fitness. So let me tell you what I fueled with on that ride. I had one water bottle, zero electrolytes and one cliff bar. It's like 20 ounces of water for four hours and like 210 calories, whatever a cliff bar is. That ride could have gone way better for me if I took in probably six times the water. Any more water would have helped and any addition of electrolytes would have helped. But if I'm thinking about how I fuel now, if I'm riding for 50 miles and it's taken me at this point now, like two and a half to three hours, but back then like four hours, I'd be hitting two bottles an hour, 
I'd be hitting probably a thousand milligrams of sodium an hour, getting my electrolytes in, and I'd be hitting 300 calories an hour. So like literally five times the amount of what I took in on that first 50 mile ride. So that's what we want to be playing with is that the easy sessions should stay easy. And if they're fueled well, they shouldn't take everything you've got. But at the same point, your first 50 mile ride, I mean, welcome to the game, man. That might knock you out a little bit and that's okay. Now, the next lesson that I want to share here is don't shoot for 1% better. Do one thing better. And I so often see guys who come from the strength or the athletic background, they're like, just want to get 1% better each day, right? Like I'm used to my lifts going up. I benched freaking two plates. Now I want to add on five more pounds, 10 pounds next week. And endurance doesn't work like that. Like you aren't getting better if your average power for a ride is 150 and then the next ride it's 152 and then 154 and then 156. Like it doesn't get, doesn't get better like that linearly. Same with the run, like you're not getting better by your zone two pace going from 10 minute mile to, oh, next week it's 955, next week it's 950. Or in the pool, if you're at a two minute pace, like you might not see 158, right? You might not see 156. And instead, what I want you to think about is doing one thing better each session. So I got five quick examples here. Before a ride, an easy way that you could get better is just prepping your bottles the night before. Make your process better. Don't be racing around the kitchen, filling up your bottles, spending 20 minutes to get out the door. Like prep your stuff the night before so you can get out and go. Fueling mid-ride, already spoke about that in the example above. Good example in the swim is that you could be better at executing on drills. Like instead of focusing on your pace getting better, Focus on developing better feel in the water and having your fist to swim drill have a little bit more feel in that. In the run, we could easily always improve our run cadence, get our run cadence up, a little bit lighter on our feet, a little bit more efficient with our form. And then when we're thinking about just like lifestyle organization, like better communication with the family, Letting our wives know, hey, we've got this big session on this day. Can I handle the kids before then so that I can take some of the load off your plate so that then you don't mind watching them when I go out for this session? And if you buy into that whole process, that is where these leaps of development will come. And all of a sudden, you'll be bought into this process. And when we do a test after six months of biking, you'll see, holy cow my power is actually up like 15 or 20 watts. Or when we do a 10K test after six months in this run process, holy crap, my 10K is like three minutes faster. I'm like 30 seconds faster a mile, right? So don't shoot for these 1% bumps in progress every day. Instead, just do one thing in your overall process better. That is how you develop. All right. Now, while all of that is true, let's get a little bit tactical on like, okay, well, what's the next level of progress look like? Number one is the ability to go longer. So you want to know what progress looks like. It looks like your longest ride being 90 minutes and then you going and riding for three hours because you've got a 70.3 coming up in 12 weeks. Like that is a huge milestone of progress. Also on just like a day-to-day -day basis, like the 45 minute endurance run, like that not gassing you out, like that is significant progress or 2,100 yards in the pool, like that not taking everything that you've got, that is huge progress. Now, when we think about how do we actually acquire speed though, right? Like we want to get faster. Number one thing we want to look into tactically day-to-day -day, is better technique. We want better technique so that we're not wasting energy and so that when we start to fatigue, our form doesn't break down. Like, let's think about somebody on the bike. They're in the back half of their 70.3 bike leg and they're tired and they were dialed in on arrow for the first half. They had their freaking legs pumping as pistons, but 
now all of a sudden they're really starting to fatigue and now their form's starting to break down. Now their knees are starting to bow out a little bit on the bike. Now all of a sudden they don't have as even distribution of workload across their quads and their hammies and their glutes. Now all of a sudden smaller muscle groups aren't really bearing any load. Now all of a sudden their form is starting to break down and they're having to work harder to go slower and they're fatiguing more. So better technique, but specifically better technique longer into sessions is a huge unlock on progress, especially on the run. Even my own experience, like my first three Ironman marathons were all over four hours because when I was fatiguing in the back half of the run, my legs were straightening out when I landed. So I wasn't bracing any impact with my stride. My joints were bracing all the impact. And all of a sudden the front of my hips were just killing me. And I felt like I was running with the brakes on. So over the past 18 months, I've been really, really dialing in on my run form, better knee bend when I land, plant, which encourages overall better muscle engagement. And in my last Ironman, I had a 15 minute marathon PR purely off of better technique. Sure, there was better fitness, more strength, all that stuff that's just happening all the time, but that was 100% off of technique. Now, while all this is going on, we will see improvements in heart rate, in pace, power, sustainable intensity. I think I already mentioned the 70.3 example of being able to hold that tempo effort in the run. Ironman would be the same kind of example, a novice Ironman, a guy doing an Ironman for the first time, like that's going to be a easy zone two day for 12 to 15 hours, hopefully faster, but that's what I've seen most commonly. And when you do your second, your third, your fourth, well, you can get up into that high zone too. You're probably not doing tempo. <laughs> You're not doing tempo for an Ironman, but that high zone too. And then I spoke about the idea that like, you might not see your pace improve, but the sessions will get easier. That's really phase one. Phase two is like, if you're in this long term, six months to a year, you're going to see your pace come down. You're going to see your runs, your run heart rate free fall. Got a great example in the team, got an athlete where February of 2023, he was doing 930 pace at about 148 heart rate and February of 2024, a year later, after a year of consistency and development, he was at 920 pace and 128 heart rate. So his pace had come down 10 seconds on what just felt easy, but also like his body got so efficient. He dropped 20 beats in his heart rate for that same feeling of intensity, right? And that's why we go back up to the feeling as well. Let's go back to the zones example, feeling of steady, right? So for him, brand new to endurance, steady for him happened to be 148 heart rate. But after a year in it, steady to him, all of a sudden his body's getting super efficient, right? We think about this green zone development, base building, fat fueling, extending capacity, like boom, he's got the data to back it up. So that's really phase two. Now let's think about like racing. Okay. So you're building towards your first 70.3. Like how are you actually putting this together? So here's how you execute a good race. And this is true of a first time 70.3 athlete or an experienced Ironman is you bring as much energy to the run as possible. And I hear so many guys they they got their first race and they're like, my goal is just to finish strong and feel good. Like, I don't really have a time goal. I don't really know I'm doing this for the first time, but like, I want to feel good crossing the finish line. Now, how do we make that happen is don't let 1.2 mile swim, take everything you got. Don't let a 56 mile ride, take everything you got and show up to that run with a decently full tank of gas. And the way that we do that is the base fitness, the fueling protocols, and then intensity management, right? So not drifting into that moderately hard intensity. Now let's think about like building towards a race and reverse engineer this a little bit. Tactically consistent time, getting green zone reps at your race duration minus the run. So first time 70.3 example, let's say you're going to do the bike in 45, sorry, let's say you're going to do the swim in 45 minutes. So 
in a quick athlete example, like let's say you've got 12 weeks to your race day and your current pace is about two minutes per 100. In 12 weeks, we might not see that pace come down to 155 or 150. Like that's all going to be built off of form and power. But what we can see is that 45 minutes in the pool, 1.2 miles, you're not freaking flopping out of the water, <laughs> having given everything you got to make that happen, right? Like your body's gotten more fit, takes less energy to do that swim. Same concept of the three hour ride. Like the first time that you ride three hours, like look at my example from my first 50. Yeah, I didn't fuel well, but like my body also had no idea how to put out that kind of an effort. So the first time I did it was freaking exhausting. The fuel could have helped, more fuel could have helped. But by the time that I got to my first 70.3, like I had put consistent time in at riding for three hours, riding for four hours. And so my first 70.3 ride, I did it like 22.4 miles an hour because I had spent 900 days, if you know my story of getting into endurance, bought the bike, expected to do the race in 16 weeks, broke my ankle, whole year's a wash, 2020, no races because of COVID, whole year's a wash, bought into the process, still doing the green zone stuff, still working the high intensity, learning how to fuel better. And after 900 days, by the time that I finally towed the starting line of my first 70.3, Three hours on the bike was no big deal. I could hammer for that length. Now I couldn't hammer into the run. I already gave you the example of the run. Like the run was that zone two effort, but I was able to push hard on the bike. And now when we think about adding together the run, so we really want to think about fueling for executing a good run. 90 minutes for a long run is totally fine. We don't need you running. 13.1 miles in training to go run 13.1 in the race. What we want to do is let's get back to that first sentence. Cause it all comes back to this simplicity, train the body to put out a steady level of effort for a long time and fuel it to keep going. And so when we think about fueling on the bike in a race, it is 100% related to setting up a good run. All right, now back to building towards the race. So the next principle that we can apply is compressing the window of time that your body is putting out that race effort. So a good example would be getting close to your race. You got a Friday swim and probably at this point we've pushed beyond just doing 2,100 yards. We're up to like 3000 yards. So we do 3000 yards on Friday. Then on Saturday we got probably a three and a half hour ride and a 30 minute run off the bike, probably hitting 56 miles in that probably running three. And then on Sunday morning, we got a long run, which is 90 minutes. We're probably hitting close to 10 miles. And the idea is that we have trained the body and we have compressed the window of time that the body is putting out that level of effort. And we are getting a massively different fitness boost. than if we did that long swim on Monday, that, long ride on Thursday, the 30 minute run off the bike. Maybe it's not off the bike. Maybe it's on Friday instead. And then we've got the long run on Saturday, like spread out over five or six days like that. We're not getting quite the fitness boost that we are going to get by compressing that window of time. I already spoke a bit on the idea of your swim pace or maybe any of your pacing getting better in a short three to four month build towards a race. But what we can see is gains on saving energy. That's the idea. And then I've already touched on it a few times, but the idea of a competitive or experienced athlete, their red zone reps and their ability to hold that tempo, right? Their, their tempo effort that I was able to hold at Oregon 70.3 on the run. Well, we can really dial in red zone reps or uh, orange zone tempo effort, right? To really build speed, power, durability. Like we want to strengthen our muscles, strengthen our bones, strengthen our tendons so that when we have evolved beyond just trying to hold that steady level of effort, we can start to put in some real strong reps at race pace and our body isn't going to break down, which is also circling back to the idea of technique and fatigue. We want our fatigue to be as staved off as long as possible. And we want to be able to maintain our form even when we're fatigued. 
And the final thing that I'll leave you with is the idea that a great race is not executed and won by who goes the fastest. A great race is executed and conquered by who slows down the least. So let's get just a quick tactical numbers example on the run. It don't matter if you start off at running eight minute miles, flying at a T2, if you eventually are running 11 minute miles in the back half of the run with significant walking, like that's not a well executed race. Instead, what would be way better is holding 930s the whole time and fueling the body to keep that effort. Back to the first point, steady level of effort for a long time and fueling the body to keep going. That is what I got here. I think that was a good run. If you got specific questions on how we develop in endurance, come hit me. 40 minutes though, I think that's pretty good.